In this episode, we're going to discuss a type of wear, a type of attrition that would not benefit from an occlusal appliance. There is no place for a splint in this type of wear. Now, the way I got the guest, Dr. Sandra Hulak, on today is uh, I was on a Facebook group for dentists, I believe it's DPR, uh, and someone posted a photo of some anterior wear. And so many people suggested occlusal appliance, splint, occlusal appliance, or something of that nature. But you see, this type of wear was not due to power function. The type of wear exhibited was functional. And therefore, in these patients, we need to stop blaming bruxism and start looking at different etiology of the wear. And this is what Dr. Sandra Hulet will break down so well. There's so many key themes that we really cover well in this episode. Hello, Patricia I'm Jazz Galanti, and welcome back to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. This episode will change the way that you see the tooth wear that you observe in your patients. We'll go on to describe the terms later, like frictional chewing pattern, etc. But not only does Sandra describe it, we show a video as well of one of my patients who exhibited uh, a constricted chewing pattern. So all these terms might be new to you, might be familiar with them, but essentially it may fool you. It looks like bruxism. It almost, you know, you look at it and you think, yeah, yeah, that's bruxism, but it's not bruxism. So it's really important important for your diagnosis so you can start getting predictability in your treatments. I was really stoked to have our guest today, Dr. Sandra Hulak. She is just absolutely brilliant. She is so giving and she is so passionate. So, so good to have her on the show. This is one of those really big episodes which might take you a while to process because we do go into the deep dark world of occlusion, my favorite place to go to. And there are two ways that this episode may just twist your mind a bit. One is with the whole, you know, think of bruxism as something else and a frictional chewing pattern as another thing. So functional wear versus power functional wear. We'll talk about that. And that itself can take a while to wrap your head around. And the other thing, which is really crazy, and for me, it took me years to realize, uh, only when I saw it in my own patient or an occlusal appliance did I realize the following right? Which is that centric relation is not always more retruded. Or the other way to say it is centric relation is not always more distal to MIP. Centric relation is not you know, up and back in the joint. And there is a case whereby some patients, their centric relation is actually anterior to their maximum intercostal position. So for those of you who are new to these terms and are getting a bit confused, we go into it a little bit, but not so much. So you might want to check out some of the more foundational episodes of Protrusive or check out OBAB. But, but let me just explain this concept because this concept is your Protrusive Dental Pearl today. Every main episode, I give you a Protrusive Dental Pearl. So the Protrusive Dental Pearl is to acknowledge and to understand and to believe in the fact that sometimes your patient centric relation is not going to be more distal. It can be anterior. And the mechanism to think about it is imagine the mandible is a foot because a foot can move, right? And the maxilla is a shoe. The shoe doesn't move. It's the foot that moves, right? So the foot fits inside the shoe. So uh, in our case, the mandible fits within the maxilla. Now, if you're wearing really tight shoes, right? So your foot's your, your foot, so it's your normal, your usual foot. So you go to the shops, you buy some shoes and the, the person gave you the wrong size of shoe. They gave you two sizes too small. So you try to put it in and you're really having to force your foot within your shoe. So imagine having to force your mandible within the maxilla and the maxilla is too small, right? And so to make it fit, the mandible might have to go back a bit. In the same way that maybe you'd have to curl your toes in, you have to really force your toes and curl them to allow you to get inside this shoe. And it's not a comfortable position to be in, but you can still walk in it. And over time, you might even adapt. The shoe might stretch a bit in a way. The foot may adapt chronically to that scenario. But the drive home point is that sometimes the shoe is too small or rather the maxilla is too small for the mandible. And the resulting bite means that the condyle actually goes further back in the glenoid fossa and therefore it's no longer in an anterior superior position and that's the whole point right of centric relation it's no longer in centric relation so for that individual whose condyle is further backwards for them their centric relation actually is further forward so i hope that made sense and maybe you have to listen to it a couple of times but basically these patients do exist and so we do mention that as well and that is your protrusive dental pearl we'll talk about how to diagnose that through occlusal appliance therapy or a jig or a uh, as Sandra describes it, the Kois D programmer. Now, enough of me blabbing. We'll join the most wonderful Dr. Sandra Hulak. Dr. Sandra Hulak, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast. Longtime fan of yours. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's such an honor. 
it's it's so great. I mean, today's a, a very cool day for me. I've got um, yourself. Just about an hour ago, I had Gregor Slavicek uh, from, from Europe. Oh, talking, wow. Uh, 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 to talk about some really cool occlusion things here. So today we're talking about a really important topic. And I'm just amazed that I, I'm with you recording right now because, you know, you look, you look at your heroes and you, you, you're very humble on, on, on Facebook and I message you, you're so incredibly humble. But it's amazing now. I know there's so many negative things about social media, right? About, you know, mental health and where it's too much. But one of the greatest things about social media is for, for young dentists to be able to, to message anyone in the world anyone, any anyone they look up to for mentorship, for advice. Uh, and we, we we connected because on DPR Facebook group, someone had posted a photo of a particular type of wear. And about 80, 90% of people were like, Bruxism, you know, watch this, power function, etc. But you are the first one. And I was thinking, wait, why has no one mentioned the CCP? And then you're the first one who mentioned it. I was like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's Sandra Hulak. So I was like, I was, I was being cheeky. I was like, you know, I, I don't think she'll reply to me, but I messaged you uh, and then you applied. So God bless you. Thank you so much. And now here we are to spread some knowledge to, 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 to share with our colleagues. So for those of you who haven't heard, and guys, please check out the, the work of Sandra Hulak uh, online. Content's amazing. Tell us a little bit about yourself, because I know you're in Hong Kong. You're my first guest from Hong Kong, uh, where you trained, yeah. what inspired you, all those things, please. Okay, so I actually come from a family of dentists. So my father is a dentist, my brother is a dentist, and my cousin is a master ceramicist. And both my father and my brother actually also started out being dental technicians. So... It's kind of a family thing. And I knew fairly early on that it was a profession that I really wanted to go into. I was, you know, not the least bit surprised in dental school, like many of my colleagues that thought it would be something altogether more different and more glamorous. I was like, okay, well, that's just how it is. And yeah, I never, I never regretted the choice of, of becoming a dentist. Now, what I regretted is when I got out of dental school, although I knew that, you know, you're not done learning. And Where actually, did you do your training? I, I just, uh, because I know you're in Hong Kong, but where did you actually do your training? I went and studied in Germany and I studied at a very, very small dental school in the north of Germany. Uh, it's uh, called the University of Wittenherdecke. And it was at that stage, one of the very few private universities in Germany, but it wasn't fee paying. You had to apply and you got in and, you know, so I actually decided to go there because my brother had gone to a very large state university, Erlangen, which is one of the foremost dental schools in the country in Munich, uh, sorry, in, in, in Bavaria, in, in Germany. And it was close to home, but it also was quite brutal because they, they accept about twice the amount of students they can have in pre-clinics. And by the time they go into clinics, they need to get rid of 50% of them. So my brother, because he was a trained dental technician, much of the stuff they have to do in pre-clinics, like, you know, the waxing, the, the all that kind of stuff, that was, you know, nothing for him. But I didn't have that training. I, wouldn't, I didn't want to go into a large dent, like where this could happen to me. So one of the things that Witten had was that it much more in, the kind of, you know, American way that they they went into clinical training much earlier than your average university where you wouldn't really see a patient before you're in the fifth term. Now, we started seeing patients in term three already. Our whole thing was like the whole patient. So you, when you were doing your, your, your cons assignment or your process assignments or your, I mean, you had to treat the whole patient. You had to go and develop a treatment plan for this patient. This patient needs this to that. And even for your, you know, finals patients, you know, we had to do, you know, by the time you do the finals, you had to do like X amount of crown preps, X amount of this, X amount of that. But that all had to happen in a patient that you had started from start to finish. So finding your final exam patient was really, really, really challenging because you had to do a fixed prost, you had to do a removable prost, you had to do crown preps and all that. Very comprehensive. So Very comprehensive. So we'd say, I'd say come from a comprehensivity kind of training. I, we were incredible. Uh, it's just like, we didn't really know why. <laughs> I mean, well, our our course coordinator, Dr. Rinaldo Ramirez, also would say like, any monkey can learn how to drill a tooth. You need to know why you do it. <laughs> so, but still, you know, when I came out of dental school, it was 1993. And I knew that I knew nothing. This is another one. You know nothing. You know nothing. You know nothing. I knew that I had knew nothing. So we certainly weren't a dental school that trained you very well in the in the art of Dunning-Kruger. 
So it mm. was... Mm. Uh, Just to get in perspective, the, how many classmates did you have, uh, Sandra? Uh, we had 20. We were 20 max. 20. That's amazing. Because one thing I really resonate with there is um, the book by, uh, I don't know if you uh, read the works of Malcolm Gladwell. I'm a huge fan of his. There's a book he wrote, yeah. David and Goliath. Uh, and, and, and he talks about it's sometimes better to be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a, in a big ocean yeah. kind of thing. And I think with your training, I think I definitely hear those vibes that you had a, a lot more smaller class sizes and therefore perhaps a better learning experience. Well, you know, I don't know when when it comes to one of the things that we had a problem with is that there wasn't that much time for theory, so to speak. And because it wasn't like a big established university yet many of the lectures we had weren't really lectures there were people that worked in the field so they didn't really that they, they knew how to do but they didn't know how to teach or they taught with a lot of passion but there was it was a lot it was a it was quite chaotic to be perfectly honest i know it's not like this anymore <laughs> It's, I noticed the university has come heaps and bounds, but in my time, boy, it was it was so chaotic. And we, we suddenly got a new dean and it was, ugh. anyhow, it was like five years of lovely chaos, seeing a lot of patients. And so one of the things that I always find when it comes to like knowledge, for example, particularly when it comes to removable process, which I know nothing about you know material science and stuff like that so I'm, I'm sometimes sitting there scratching my head and people go like yeah it's like blah 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 and I'm like how come I don't know this yeah because nobody <laughs> ever taught you that in university stupid on the other hand because we were doing preclinics with internal with like we were doing preclinics with the medical students you know it wasn't separate mm -hmm. because it was big medical faculty there as well it's actually much much more famous for its medical faculty and so I can still you know run circles around many like when my partner asked me something medical and I'm like well it's because of this and this is like how do you know this and I'm like because I went to university you know the same thing you did but so my training was great in some aspects totally lacking in other aspects but the most important thing is that you got to understand when you do dental school you come out and it's very good to know that you know nothing you know nothing because, and you know, you can do dentistry for years and you still know nothing because you're never done learning, never. Sandra, I 100% agree. But the, the, the difference now, Sandra, is that, yes, we still know nothing when we come out. But the danger and the real sad thing now is not only do we do nothing, we have done nothing. I have done like, you know, we've done like one root canal in, exactly. in, my, in my class, in my peers. You know, the, the amount of the volume is not there. Sounds like you had a bit more comprehensivity, as you, oh. as you called it, and a bit more volume behind you, which I think is, is a real danger or a real worry about new graduates. Yeah, so no, and it, it, quite right so. And I think actually, so it's a double-sided sword on one kind. Well, I think when you're, you're coming out as a fresh grad out of university, you know, you in most countries, you paid an extraordinary amount of money, not in the UK, but in the US you have. You've received or what you think you have received very comprehensive training because that's obviously what they tell you, that, you know, you're the best trained. And then you go out in the real world and nothing is like how it was, you know, for once you find out, you know, you can't take the teeth out of the patient's mouth like you could do in the phantom head. And, you know, you can't sort of, you know, pull the cheek away when you have a difficult cavity and all that stuff, you know, so, so, and if you haven't done it, then I think it's very hard. You just have to, then, then many people make the decision as like that they, they stop even trying and then or maybe they, they try and do their best and they still cling on to a notion that, you know, they were so well trained or they, they realize that they have to go a completely different way and become extremely conscientious and, you know, really then look at, for example, my God on Instagram, what's available and these people then seek out mentors. I mean, I did not grow up in the time of the internet. So for me, it was, it took me a little while to, I always had an inkling that, you know, I needed to know more. But then, you know, I started working in London. I actually worked in London for nine years. And uh, I uh, worked first in the East End. That was pretty rough. <laughs> for like, <laughs> like four months in Bow, next to, you know, the Royal London Hospital. Whereas, I mean, in a, in a full-on NHS practice, you know, where, where we had... No way. Where we had where we had portable suction units, you know, the ones you rolled around, which you had to empty at the end of the day. Yeah. 
And wow. it wasn't an. I, I would never have thought an, that you spent time uh, in. in no, no, I mean, no, uh, total, dentistry. no, 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 <laughs> total, totally. And the building I was working at, the Bow Dental Surgery on Bow Road, naturally, was allegedly once owned by the Cray twins. So you know that. The, so so it's like it, <laughs> it had no heating in winter. It was just miserable. So I worked there, uh, but you know I I, I I saw volume. You know I saw volume again. You know, and. Then I started working in a kind of semi-private practice and I stayed there for a little, I stayed there for four years and then I opened a private practice for Bupa in Tower Hill. But I always felt, you know, I needed to know more. And when I then started working in Hong Kong in 2001, it was the first time that I worked in a big group practice. And I suddenly had like... I just want to know, like what a... took you to Hong Kong? Was it, was, it, was it family? Was it love? Was it, what was it? Yeah, it was, it was my husband's job, basically. So he got, got offered a job with Citigroup to go over to Hong Kong. And we thought we were going to stay for like maybe three years max. And I was going to go back to the university. And uh, I wanted to do maybe a master's in endodontics, believe it or not, which which I really loved at that time. And now I haven't had a root canal in years, obviously. <laughs> and, but so, so that didn't pan out. So I took my licensing exam. I passed my licensing exam. And then I started working. And this practice was suddenly, you know, there were so many good dentists there. They were all like, they were so, they knew so much more than me. And I was just like, and I knew they knew much more than me. And then I, you know, then I started working there. Then I had a couple more children. And finally, in 2007, when it comes to, you know, big decisions, but which time I had been working for 14 years, you know, I, which is one of my biggest regrets that I didn't start this earlier, but 2007, the time was right. My youngest children were just two years old. I could finally really leave them. And I took myself off to Seattle to John Coy's. Yeah. So I went to Seattle to train and I started taking the whole curriculum of John Coy's. And when it comes to, you know, postgraduate education, I still think, I think it's the best in the world. If you want to have a comprehensive program that teaches you literally the alpha to omega of dentistry and gives you, you know, I don't know, and also puts you in touch with a bunch of great people and mentors. Uh, and it opens really, it opened it wor- opened the world to me. I am so grateful to, to Dr. Kois and everybody in the Kois Center. And, you know, what happens when you are finished, uh, then the Kois Center, typically you start, mentoring other people and eventually you become a mentor and eventually become a clinical instructor and that's what I am since this year so I will go back in September and actually you know be clinical instructor on my first course which doesn't mean I really instruct but I'm just really there to help Dr. Coys to facilitate the best learning process that's it's I mean it's really amazing. I mean, everyone who's who's done Coys has, has said such wonderful things. He's a, a gentleman and a, and a philosophy and a camp that I respect so much, uh, so much time. And and of you know, behind the scenes, those who are listening can't see the screen right now, but I know you've got the the checklist and stuff, which are so comprehensive and thorough that that they they put out. And it's it's just great that we are lucky in dentistry to have the institution. And John Coys will be the first one to acknowledge that there are many many ways that lead to Rome. What he has just tried to do is to give everybody an easy entry point you know it doesn't mean that this is a cult and you have drunk the kool-aid he doesn't want you to stop thinking but what he wants to do is give you a system and systems are not recipes systems create foundations recipe creates ceilings you know so there is no recipe to this it's just you know a a system of record taking a system of diagnosis because if you don't have a diagnosis what are you going to do? Because and 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 when it comes to where where is not a diagnosis, I and mean, you don't need to go to dental school to tell somebody, oh, Mrs. Brown, your teeth are worn. Yeah, I know that, doctor. I can see it. You know, so you don't need to. You need to know what is the origin of where. So what is the what is the where? It's a symptom of an underlying occlusal disease. Or, you know, Which leads us so perfectly to the exact uh, issue we want to talk about. You you timed that really well. That was that was you know you, you rehearsed that. You must have. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so we, we, it, was, it was wonderful. So, so so we saw that photo on that on that group, uh, and so you identified it, and, and so did I. But I was surprised that no one else did. That you suspected that this wear was a CCP or a constricted chewing pattern. So now for those listening, what? Uh, and, and they may also have uh, looked at it and say, oh, yeah, Bruxum, we see some wear, automatically assume is Bruxum. So this episode is called Stop Blaming Bruxum because there could be some other diagnoses that we can make. So what guidelines can you give 
to equip dentists listening and watching to be able to now change their perspective and facilitate them to make such a diagnosis. So what are the classic features? What are the classic signs that we see that may lead to us? So just give us a, the background on this type of wear. Okay, so I want to start out with to tell all our listeners that bruxism is the most overdiagnosed disease in dentistry because everybody will immediately jump to bruxism as soon as they see any kind of wear. Now, real bruxism is actually an extremely rare beast because it's a neurological issue. It's an above-the-nose problem. So it comes from the basal ganglia. And what the patient will do, he will go sideways. So in my bruxism is always lateral and posterior. And if you give Agreed. these people a mouth guard, you will actually see, you can read that mouth guard and that mouth guard looks like a Samboni machine has gone over it. You will see the tracks on the mouth guard. This is your classic bruxa. What people then uh, very often see, they see, they see anterior wear and they say like, oh, this person is a bruxa. Now, anterior wear will only happen in bruxism if the patient has flattened the posteriors so much that he will, or his canine so much that he actually can get onto his anteriors, okay? And the wear in the anterior wear in bruxism will be flat because the patient goes over the surfaces all the time. Now, if we see anterior wear, solely anterior wear or anterior wear that looks different, like little spicules, little thin wear on the palatal where, you know, the enamel where you really patients are hollowing out these palatal surfaces. This is never wear from bruxism. This is where that happens in function. And this is what people don't understand, that wear can happen if the function isn't functioning properly. So if your occlusion, if you, you can either have, you know, something called occlusal dysfunction, where your, your chewing envelope is so large, where your envelope of function is so large because your brain can't find the back teeth. And, you know, this is a completely different pattern, but we could call this occlusal dysfunction. Or you have something called constricted chewing pattern or frictional chewing pattern, which are two different things, whereby because of dentistry or very often because of orthodontics, by the way, or because the patient grew wrong, you have just during chewing too much contact between the facial surfaces of the lower anteriors and the palatal surfaces of the upper anteriors, because these teeth actually in function should never touch. And one of the things that's, and that's why, for example, unfortunately, many of these problems are, or you see many, many constricted chewing envelope patients that had previous orthodontics, because orthodontic cases are very often finished in the growing patients, say 14 to 16 years old, we're done. The young orthodontist is, or the orthodontist is taught in orthodontist's school that the front teeth have to touch. The facial growth isn't finished, particularly in the male. If your, chew, if your growth pattern is somewhat brachyfacial, these people literally grow through their front teeth and destroy them. And so mm -hmm. this is why, you know, my orthodontist and I always like, um, leave me room there. I don't want, I don't want any touching on the centrals and laterals. Never ever do I want to see a shimstock contact on a central or a lateral ever. If I'm doing restorative dentistry, I check this out in static and, you know, functional in function. I don't want to have much contact on these teeth because they don't have to. And even, even, you know, you can go and look at all uh, kind of, you know, occlusal concepts. But there are certain things we have decided to unilaterally own. And even Dawson writes, you know, in the big book that one of the biggest mistakes a restorative dentist can make is to constrict the envelope of function, okay? And very often this is also done with restorative dentistry, you know, you bulky surfaces of anterior crowns and so on. And the, but the, the, the technician looks at it and the articulate and goes like, that looks fine, lots of room, but he doesn't know how this patient chews. You know, and even you can have all the functional analysis, you can do all the anterior incisal tables in the world, still it's probably different in the patient's mouth. And you got to check it out mm -hmm. in the mouth first. So, so it's fair to say that br bruxism is 
inside to outside. Uh, and then when we see the type of wear that, that you described now, it's, it's function, so it's outside to, to inside. It's the hollowing out of the uh, palatals of the upper against the facial of the lower. Yeah. You have said this, this is a very important, the outside in and inside out. So this whole thing, when we're, sent, when we're checking the envelope of motion, so the limitations of the chewing envelope, right? working left, working conclusion, you know. Um, I'm just doing this for our listeners. So, so people don't chew like that. This is this is an inside out movement. It's completely useless. It's I mean, it's great, you know, when you do it on the patient and you go like, oh, now move your lower jaw to the, re to the right and they go like, which jaw do you want me to move? Because they actually, <laughs> this is, this, they have no idea what you mean because, because this is not a natural, this is not a natural movement. So the only people that know how to move their jaw to the right or the left under tooth contact immediately are dental students or proxies. So this is, yes, by the way, very yes. interesting. So when you have somebody in the chair that knows immediately what you want to do, like that's somebody where I go, oh, 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 this might be a proxy. It has the memory, the muscle memory, the, the muscle memory for the movement, because this is a difficult movement. And we see like you have to contract like two muscles on one side, release three muscles on the other side. So, yes, but chewing doesn't work that way. Chewing is an outside in movement. So as such, it's it's causing a completely different wear pattern as you will ever figure out in left left working, right working, and so on and so forth. Could you now show us some uh, photos because uh, you're sharing the screen? Uh, do you have any photos to show us this type of wear, and then perhaps just just describe it for the audio listeners in case we do end up uh, having to spin there for the audio listeners as well? Okay, so let me just do my share now. This is uh, what I'm what I'm showing here is a classic test now uh, for a constriction. So this is uh, for your for our audio listeners. This is a patient that has very thin and worn upper front teeth, and they're also quite short. And what uh, and when we look on the inside, we can see distinctive wear on the palatal surfaces of those upper front teeth. And what I'm doing here, and I do this a lot when I see anterior wear, I let actually people chew on a piece of 200 micron thick horseshoe paper because that's precisely the amount of space we want to have between the teeth during mastication, between the anteriors during mastication and during any kind of, you know, functional movement like talking or swallowing. So that's that's the minimum amount of space we need. And if this paper shows us a lot of tracking marks on the anteriors, very often we know that there might be a problem. Now, it, it's not solely that this is a CCP now or a functional chewing envelope. This could be also a dysfunctional chewing envelope. That is why we need to have more diagnostic tools. But very often this is, you know, uh, a first thing we see. When it comes to how we show it to the patient, you know, uh, but what before I have you come to that, Sandra, can you just explain yeah. the difference between a, a constriction and a frictional chewing pattern? What are the key differences there? Okay, actually, I wanted. That's why I want to quickly show this video. But basically, a frictional chewing pattern means that you know, okay, the teeth are hollowed out, but the mandible doesn't get distalized in full MIP, which is you know basically maximal intercuspital position. So when you close fully, the mandible doesn't distalize. In a CCP, in a real constricted chewing pattern, in an active chewing pattern, the mandible is actually pushed back when you close. And that is, you know, now we're getting into the whole thing. But centric means the mandible is always going backward. No, it isn't, you know, because very often in centric, the mandible actually wants to go forward because the mandible is for it's reasons. It's being forced you know, by the maxilla. It's, it's, no it's actually, yeah, exactly. It's being, it's being trapped by the maxilla. And mm, uh, mm. so it's actually distalized in full seating. So what I have here, I just quickly show that for our people that actually are. So what you see here, you need to look at the, um, you can see uh, the, the constricted chewing pattern, how the patient is first when he goes in hitting on the front teeth and now distalized. And you can see what happens to the disc as well, that, you know, the disc actually is anteriorly positioned when the mandible is fully closed because the, the condyle is pushed so far back. Did you Sandra, I'm going to share my video if you don't mind now, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Can you, can you, <laughs> can, can you see this? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's watch no, that's, the video. That's, that's classic, yeah. But then what I do is I, I, I make it in slow motion now and I watch watch it in slow motion. I think it goes like this. This is really. And then 
it really gets forced back. Oh man, yeah. That was unlucky growth here. Yes, exactly. And but I think it's a nice little clinical demonstration um, to, to supplement your um, animation. Did this patient have premolar ex uh, extractions on the top? Just wondering. I don't know. It, no. Yeah, I, I'd like to know as well. I, I don't remember. So uh, back to you, Sandra. So I, I hope that was, um, w would you agree that that's exactly, that is a classic that's, CCP? That's exactly, that's that's pretty much a classic CCP. And I would think that this patient, because there's actually not that much wear on the teeth, okay, she has, she's probably very adapted. I would think that she's completely off the disc and she might be a little, you know, she might, she might be quite symptomatic. What we typically find in that that females don't really wear their teeth that every everything else hurts but because the muscles are you know weaker then they will typically end up with a lot more pain symptoms while men they mm, just destroy mm -hmm. their teeth you know they don't have any pain the muscles are so strong they just destroy the teeth yeah very valid obs observation do you, do you want to share again uh, your, your your screen okay so, so the, the important the important distinction between a frictional envelope and a proper constricted envelope is that in a frictional envelope the mandible isn't distalized in in full in full closure, but in a frictional it is. So we used to call a frictional envelope an adapted constriction. So thinking and sometimes it is an adapted constriction whereby you know the patient has worn away so much of their front teeth that you know they now they can seat into that and no further wear will occur or whatever wear is going to occur future in future to the teeth won't won't be due to friction but will be due to chemical issues for example because once you've worn away all the enamel from the palatal of the upper front teeth you know your dentin is going to erode once it's exposed that's just going to happen but that's not going to happen because of friction that's just happening because of mastication because of you know acidity of food and so on and so forth well, when you're looking at these two different patients uh, very similar but different um, di diagnoses mm -hmm. clinically mm -hmm. I think the key distinction factor is actually seeing that mandible distalize and getting a hint that, okay, there's a, a mandibular distalization happening, but it's very difficult to diagnose clinically, right? Correct. And you, in order to diagnose it clinically, you got to actually, you know, put this patient in, yeah, you have to get a centric registration record and see where does this mandible actually want to go and where does it want to be, okay? And how far is it going to come forward or, or backward or whatever? Mm. And one of the problems in this is where, you know, People, people, old school nosology go like, this is bullshit, this doesn't happen, the mandible always goes goes back, it's a fully seated joint, it's always distal to MIP, blah, blah, de, blah, 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 blah. This is where, for example, using a leaf gauge is going to bring you, give you a big problem if this is a true constriction because the only thing I was just going to say is, this exact is, point uh, Sandra that I'm a huge fan of the leaf gauge but when I suspect this diagnosis so I might then go to a acrylic jig. Yeah. Exactly. You cannot, because a leaf gauge will always distalize your your mandible or, or it, you're running into big, big trouble to, you know, push that joint back even further. And so you don't want to do that. So what I do when I suspect this and what I do with most of my patients is I put them in a so-called Coisty programmer, which is your agilic crick, but, but it's basically an appliance that can be worn for, a, it needs to be worn for a very long time because particularly when it comes to Construction cases are much easier, but when it comes to occlusal dysfunction and, and a brain that's utterly confused and has no idea where the bite is, where everything is, you need to let the what we call the motion generator, the general, the uh, you know, the general pattern generator, f forget so to speak how everything is supposed to fit together, so that the joint can seat and that the muscles are relaxed. And for this, you need time. And patients cannot run around with a jig forever because I mean, it's annoying. So here is where you know the the Coisty programmer comes in, and I'm just going to show you. A quick case. So now here for our listeners, we have a case here with a patient, I did that a very long time ago, that kept breaking her front teeth. And there was a fair amount of lingual wear on those teeth as well. 
And she also had a fair amount of uh, wear on her back teeth and basically no more occlusal home because of poor restorative dentistry. So I wasn't going to go and restore this case before I knew actually where she wanted to be. So on the left, we can see now this is a Koisty programmer in action. So it's basically like a Holly retainer, but it's got a tiny little what we call platform behind the upper front teeth. So it can be worn during the day and, you know, people can talk with it it's a little bit annoying these days we can make them without the wires in the front and you just scan them and you just have a and have an appliance that really just sits palatal but basically what you have with this the patient wears this as much as possible and they only take it out for brushing teeth and for eating and you want the patient to wear this for a good solid week and uh, get back to you so every morning when they take it out uh, you want them to sit up, tilt the head back about 45 degrees and have the end closed together. And eventually you will find that where they, when they say, is, oh, my teeth meet in the same spot every time I take this appliance out. And that means that they are now deprogrammed. And that's what you then want to see when you actually mount the models in the bite you have taken with the appliance in place, by the way. This is what's so smart about it, because when you take a a jig very often or any other centric registration if you guide the patient with something you you have to remove the appliance okay with jigs you don't but this has the advantage that it can be worn for so long which in my opinion is sometimes really necessary so when you then take the take the bite registration you have much more security that the patient is really going to give you the centric bite and then you mount this and you analyze the model in a constricted chewing pattern or a frictional chewing pattern. The patient will say, my front teeth meet first, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, or I have my heaviest front teeth. And in a dysfunctional chewing pattern, the patient will typically say that the first contact happens on you know, one premolar or so, or can, can be, can be a lower seven or something like that. You very often mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. premature contacts on those. So, yeah. So this is how a Koisty programmer looks basically, you know, a, a Holly with a little platform, but you know, that's my, it's my tool. It's my tool of choice. Do you okay. um, use this um, like routinely or only when you suspect a CCP or a frictional chew pattern? For example, do, is the leaf gauge still in your drawer for a more straightforward oh, oh, case oh. where you're... So bloody lutely. I, I love taking a leaf gauge, but only when I'm 100% sure. And even when I use, I always look, if I put my patients, because I do a lot of quite complex full mouth rehabilitations because I, I specialize or I'm a specialist when it comes to, you know, restorative cosmetic and wear cases and stuff like this. So I put my patients in temporaries for a long time. I'm not, I'm not going straight into porcelain, you know. Because mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that this this works before we do this. So I'm um, these days. I mean, in former days, you know, I used to I used to let me just show you a case. In former times, I used to put people into milk provisionals, and these days I do everything. I do everything with injectables because I'm a big. So here I have a, a case I just did recently, and uh, for our viewers, you can see you can have have an extremely deep bite situation. The patient keeps breaking her front teeth at all, everything also looks pretty ugly. And you can see now in the middle of the screen how this patient is hollowing out the inside of her upper front teeth. I mean, that's that's like that left that's central is about to break off. <laughs> I mean, that's that tooth is so bombed out. And this patient, like pretty much everybody, has no money and doesn't really want to do every, anything. So I mean, while you're having a drink that, you could see how the central incisors there have not got so much torque. Right, and that's part of the, mm. the the diagnosis, part of the issue. Yes, 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 yes. They're like they're like you know slightly, very upright, they're slightly very upright, very upright, very upright, and the lower incisors will be very often pretty retroclined because they already have been trying during growth to get out of the way, but you know not enough. So in her case, so here we have a pretty much bombed out occlusion as well. And so here, actually, here I did take the registration with a jig that I bonded behind her front teeth because she wasn't going to, she's a headhunter. She needs to talk all the time. She wasn't going to wear the deprogrammer. Okay. So this is what I did. So I don't know if you can see that, but there is actually a small bonded platform on the back of these teeth. This is how I take my centric registration. They sit in the waiting room for like 20 minutes and constrict chewing patterns. They deprogram very, very quickly because their lower jaw wants to come forward. They want to come forward. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it loves. what we then do, we wax these cases in centric 
and I don't know, is, is injection, is the, the kind of ejection molding technique, is that a big thing in the UK already or has yes, that not Yes, growing. Come? Yes, absolutely. Using the GC uh, injectable resins. Injectable, I love doing it myself. exactly. But it's great to hear that you're using it as, you know, I'm, I'm loving the direction you're going in, is that you moved away from the mill crowns to, to this. It, it sounds great. If I need a patient, if I need to get the patient out of his pronto, I mean, who can afford? We're talking, we're talking, we're talking about, you know, this is basically a full mouth case. We're looking at about 150,000 US dollars worth of dentistry. Who can afford this just like that? Mm. But I know mm. if I don't get this patient off her front teeth pronto, she's going to she's gonna make them unrestorable possibly within a year. I need to get her off her front teeth. So that's where injectables are great. So here we have the classic thing where we have a wax up and we duplicate the first wax up model and then we knock off every second tooth because we're using alternating matrices, two matrices per arch. And then we go and we start. And so I'm going here through this. This is this for me. This is a fun day. It took me six hours, but it's basically all the teeth. And, uh, and you can for, the, for those see, listening, what, what what Sandra is showing essentially is that she uh, Sandra's doing injection molded, long term, direct, temporary crowns, like composite exactly. crowns, is is what you're doing, which is great. To see, yeah. exactly, it's uh, exactly, and and I know I give the patient. I said, look, I don't know how long this is going to last because it is pushing the material to its limits. And if you talk to GC, they say, yeah, you know, you can do it, but it's also yeah, we're good for occlusion, but this is like. This is, this is really pushing it. So I say to the patient, look, now I've gotten you off your front teeth and you, and here we have, we do the same thing. You know, we make the patient chew and we see, we get, I get rid with all those little contacts we have, but you know, she's not on those front teeth so much anymore. And now you have the finished case. Uh, basically, you can see that there's a significant bite opening we have done, but we don't just mm -hmm. have opened the bite by letting the patient, by l rotating the mandible open and distalizing it more. We actually have allowed the mandible to come forward. So this patient has been in these provisionals now for about eight months, and she's actually moving to the UK. So I'm going to finish off her upper front teeth because I want, you know, I obviously want to give her the biggest bang for the buck. I said, when you're in the UK, because she needs some, she needs some implants down there. Those two lower front teeth are toast. The ones that look a little bit gray. She is obviously, she needs, she needs a lot of dentistry, but the nice thing is now she has the time to sequence this treatment out to a point, you know, where finances and time allow, because at the end, yes, she added a little bit of cost to the treatment, but it, it bought her the luxury of time. And as I say, in this case, although I know that this is most definitely a constricted chewing envelope, I'm much more comfortable in doing this just with a jig bite because, but I still would have never taken a, a leaf gauge with a jig bite because I know I'm going to, I'm going to temporize her like this. And so I had uh, these kind of patients you then bring back for short appointments and adjust the, adjust the occlusion, you know, make sure there's no streaks on those front teeth, make sure when they chew uh, that, you know, their back teeth really crisp into a very nice occlusion because you don't want them to chew too lateral. So that's, you know, now this is, this is a different topic uh, when it comes to occlusion equilibration, but you want this bite to be like where they go like, wow, this feels really good. And then you're done. And now you can segment this case out because, hey, I'm not Frank Spear. I'm not John Coyce. I'm not going to prep, I don't know, 28 teeth and, you know, do a jig bite and then do, I don't know, cross mounting and stuff like that. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. No, <laughs> I'm doing it like this. <laughs> I love this to is, see that. And I think everyone's going to love to see this. Uh, just a technical question uh, on the posteriors. Were the posteriors um, temporary uh, PMMA crowns or were they also injection molded? Yeah, that's all injected molded. That stuff is strong as. Yeah. Yes, so you got uh, pretty much posterior uh, injectable resin crowns. Crowns, exactly. Posteriorly as well. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, they look so great. Yeah. I mean, that's because because it's a it's a nice wax up and it's good matrices. So yeah, it's it's pretty nice. And as I say, you can do this quite reasonably because the lab cost, at, at least for me, is not that high and the material is not that expensive. So you can do this for a fraction of a crown price. And what I very often say to the patient, look, for me, this is also easy because now the only thing I have to do is, you know, I've obviously removed the decay. This stuff is also my core build up already. I can just prep these teeth now to ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So it's yeah, it's probably yeah, bonded on there. So I can now I, when I prepped her her ten upper front teeth, this was a doddle. You know, I just I just have to get the margins back to you know tooth, and do my stuff. But I'm quite happy to leave. Much of this is core built up. It's a very strong resin material. Okay, so mm -hmm. restorativity is 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 a, is a dream. This scenario actually very good. It's very nice now, and I have, but I have patients also with constricted chewing patterns and stuff like this for for much longer. I have one case where I completely changed the occlusion. He's three years out now, and I brought him forward and gave him the bite he was happy with. Now, when the material wears in the ideal case scenario, your teeth are going to erupt into occlusion. You know that's the whole you know concept dull concept. In, in mini, so to speak, because obviously you still mm -hmm. want to have a supported occlusion. What you don't want is, you know, big parts. That's why I personally never dial because I think it's too much. It's too many teeth. But typically, if you just one posterior tooth is out of occlusion, you still have a supported occlusion. This tooth should erupt in, in occlusion into occlusion. Mm -hmm. So as the so just a few um, different teeth, side yeah. questions I want to I want to I want to lead you down now based on uh, the case you showed mm -hmm. me is that one of the questions that we are going to discuss is the role of pre-restorative orthodontics because what you've shown yeah. there is a wonderful case where this was managed purely restoratively uh, and finding this new joint position which is going to be in her case slightly further forward because it's now no yes. longer distalized and uh, by increasing the OVD you now had uh, some space. Tell us about uh, what percentage of cases, A, would you like to, uh, in an ideal world, you know, have a wand and say, okay, this patient is going to have orthodontics and go through the, the, the pain and misery of that? And, and B, what actually happens in terms of what percentage actually get on board of that? And what is your cutoff point at which point you say, you know what, if you don't know ortho, no treatment? Well, there we have it, guys. What does Sandra say? Well, you we have to find out in part two because I've left you on a bit of a cliffhanger. Now, part two, it will be on the app, on the premium app and the free app. Uh, so you know, download the Protrusive app if you haven't already. And you can actually get it for free, by the way. You don't have to pay. If you want to get CPD and watch the premium videos, then yes, you should subscribe to Protrusive Premium. Absolutely. But you can watch the episodes for free as well. So this part two, because it's so visual, she shares cases and examples and how she uses the articulating paper to diagnose these issues and even sharing a failure and how she rectified it. You always have to respect clinicians that share their failures. So the way you'll be able to access part two next week is on the Protrusive app only. It's not going to be in YouTube. It'll be on Protrusive app. It'll be on free version as well. Part two will be a free version on the app. It will be the premium version, which can get the CPD and the premium notes, but it will only be accessible through the app. So you can go on your browser, for example, www.protrusive.app, and you can actually check out all my content via your browser. You don't have to do it on your phone. Some people don't like the idea of learning on their phone. That's totally cool. You can do it on your laptop. Thank you so much once again for listening all the way to the end. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. Hi, my name is Mahmoud Ibrahim. And I'm Jazz Galati. And we wanted to make the best occlusion course in the universe. Now, we know that sounds like a big task and a huge ask. But we did I it. Think we did it. We did it. We finally made OBAB occlusion basics and beyond. And we've really, really worked our butts off to give you an occlusion course that is going to be applicable to real world dentistry. So, what's included in this pre launch deal? Well, we've got five different things for you. First of all, is the OBAB starter kit. We're going to send you a starter kit so you can start implementing the concepts we're going to teach you straight away on Monday morning. It's got a Huffman leaf gauge we imported from the US, and this is our favorite leaf gauge. It's also got a pack of shim stock in it, so you don't have to use your fat fingers every time. We're going to send you a pair of Miller forceps as well. The starter kit is worth £100, and we'll start shipping it once the course access begins on 7th of April. I think really anyone interested in occlusion, whether you are at the beginning of your career, in the middle, or even getting towards the end, uh, would learn a huge amount from this particular program. The second benefit of this pre-launch deal is we're going to give you £500 off of the cost of the course. And you can take our word for it that we're never going to price it this low ever again. And this course truly has an unbelievable return on investment. The third benefit of the pre-launch deal is that instead of getting 12 months of access, we're going to extend that so you get two whole years of OBAB. And that's a no extra charge. And we're going to be adding lots of new cases and content as we go. I felt like I finally understood topics that I just struggled to wrap my head around for years. Um, and that's purely down to the way in which the content's delivered. 
The fourth benefit of this pre-launch deal is you'll get one fully mentored case with us included. That I think is, is massive. So we've set up a case forum and you can submit your cases for mentorship. So you get one fully mentored case at no additional cost worth 550 pounds. We're here to help and we wanna help you through your cases. and wanna hold your hand through some of these cases and you have the opportunity to do that without feeling bad as part of a structured and organized way. And last but not least, it's the OBAB book. Now this is gonna be a fantastic companion to the online course. And it's got the world's first visual glossary of occlusion. This is gonna blow your mind. It's gonna explain occlusion to you like you're five years old. Fairly advanced five year old. Yeah, very, very intelligent five year old. But you get the point. We are so confident that you're gonna get an amazing return on investment because Understanding inclusion unlocks so much of restorative dentistry and you'll start taking on bigger cases and you'll start having more fun in dentistry. Now this pre-launch deal ends on the 21st of March. So what are you waiting for? If you are finally ready to say that occlusion doesn't confuse me anymore and you wanna go from assessment, diagnosis and delivering high quality dentistry because that's what occlusion allows us to do, then let's take a giant leap towards predictable dentistry. It is the best course that I have ever done and I would recommend it to any dentist, whether you have a basic understanding of occlusion or even an advanced one, you will still gain a lot from this course. Take advantage of this pre-launch deal ending on the 21st of March. Sign up at occlusion.online.